I'm Lister Sinclair, and this is Ideas. The 1996 Massey Lectures scheduled for this week will not be heard. In their place, we present a rebroadcast of the 1990 Massey Lectures, entitled Biology as Ideology, the Doctrine of DNA, by Richard C. Lewinton. The Massey Lectures have been an annual event on CBC Radio since 1961. They are commissioned by the CBC to present the work of leading intellectuals in the humanities, the arts, politics and the physical and social sciences. The 1990 Massey Lectures are presented by Richard C. Lewinton, distinguished evolutionary biologist and Alexander Agassiz Professor of Zoology at Harvard University. Last night, Professor Lewinton set out to disprove the popular claim that science is objective, that it is somehow above the social and political fray. He claimed that far from being objective, science reflects the dominant social ideology. The problems that science deals with, the methods that it uses in investigating those problems, and even the way scientific results are interpreted, are influenced, says Dr. Lewinton, by predispositions that come from the society in which we live. And he claims that science in turn serves to justify and legitimize the existing social order. So it's no accident, for example, that as women's liberation began to take hold, there were all sorts of scientific studies done which proved that women were, by their very nature, not suited to power. Similar studies have popped up periodically which justify racial and class inequality. Professor Lewinton claims that this kind of biological determinism has been one of the chief ideological weapons of those who have power in their effort to hold on to their power. Professor Lewinton is well placed to critique the claims of biological determinists. His chief scientific work has been to study the nature of genetic differences in populations, and he has contributed important molecular methodologies which have advanced the work in this field. Armed with his research findings, much of his political energy has been devoted to debunking the claims of biological determinists. It was to this end that he co-authored the widely read book Not in Our Genes with Stephen Rose and Leo Kamen. Tonight, Professor Lewinton continues with part two of Biology as Ideology, the Doctrine of DNA. The society we live in today was born at least politically in revolutions in the 17th century in Britain and in the 18th century in France and America. Those revolutions swept out an old order that was characterized by aristocratic privilege and a lack of social mobility of persons in society. The bourgeois revolutions in England, in France, and America claimed that this old society and its ideology were illegitimate, and the ideologues of those revolutions produced and legitimized a new ideology of liberty and equality. Diderot and the encyclopedists and Tom Paine were the theorists of a society of liberté, égalité, and fraternité, of all men created equal. The writers of the American Declaration of Independence asserted that political truths were self-evident, and what was self-evident was that all men were created equal, that they were endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these is the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, by which, of course, they meant the pursuit of money. They meant literally all men, because women were not given the right to vote in the United States until 1920, in Britain until 1928, and indeed in Quebec, not until 1940. And, of course, they didn't mean all men, because slavery continued in the French dominions and in the Caribbean until the middle of the 19th century, and blacks were defined by the United States Constitution as only three-fifths of a person, and for most of the history of English parliamentary democracy, you had to have money to vote. To make a revolution, you need slogans that appeal to the great mass of people. And you can hardly get people to shed blood under a banner that reads, Equality for Some. So the ideology and the slogans outstrip the reality. For if we look around at the society that has been created by those revolutions, we see, in fact, a great deal of inequality inequality of wealth and power among individuals, between sexes, between races, and between nations. 
Yet we have heard over and over again in school and had it drummed into us by every organ of communication that we live in a society of free equals. The contradiction between the claimed equality of our society and the observation that great inequalities exist has been, for North Americans at least, the major social agony of the last 200 years. It has motivated an extraordinary amount of our political history. How are we to cope with immense inequalities in a society that claims to be founded on equality? Well, there are two possibilities. One, we can say that it's all a fake, a set of slogans meant to replace a regime of aristocrats with a new regime of wealth and privilege of a different kind, that inequality in our society is structural and an integral aspect of the whole of our political and social life. To say that, however, would be deeply subversive because it would call for yet another revolution if we wanted to make good on our hopes for liberty and equality for all. It's not an idea that's very popular among teachers, newspaper editors, college professors, radio producers, or successful politicians, indeed anyone who has the power to help form public consciousness. The alternative, which has been the one taken since the beginning of the 19th century, has been to put a new gloss on the notion of equality. Rather than the equality of result, what has been meant is equality of opportunity. In this view of equality, life's a foot race. In the bad old days of the Ancien Regime, the aristocrats got to start at the finish line, whereas all the rest of us had to start at the beginning. So, of course, the aristocrats won. In the new society, the race is supposed to be fair. Everyone is to begin at the starting line, and everyone has an equal opportunity to come in first. Of course, some people are faster runners than others, and so, of course, some get rewards and others don't. According to this view, the old society was characterized by artificial barriers to equality, whereas the new society allows a natural sorting process to decide who's to get the status, who's to get the wealth, who's to get the power, and who is not. Nature and biology become the chief arbiters. Such a view does not threaten the status quo, but on the contrary supports it by telling those who are without power that their position is the inevitable outcome of their own innate deficiencies, and that therefore nothing can be done about it. A remarkably explicit recent statement of this assertion is the one by Richard Herrnstein, a professor of psychology from Harvard who is one of the leading modern ideologues of natural inequality. In an extremely popular book of 1973, he wrote, the privileged classes of the past were probably not much superior biologically to the downtrodden, which is why revolution had a fair chance of success. By removing artificial barriers between classes, society has encouraged the creation of biological barriers. When people can take their natural level in society, the upper classes will, by definition, have greater capacity than the lower. Of course, we're not told precisely what principle of biology guarantees that biologically inferior persons cannot seize power from biologically superior ones, but it's not the logic that's at issue here. Such statements are meant to convince us that although we may not live in the best of all conceivable worlds, we live in the best of all possible worlds. The social entropy has been maximized so that we have as much equality as possible because the structure is essentially one of equality. And whatever inequalities are left over are not structural, but are based on innate differences between individuals. In the 19th century, this was also the view. And education was seen, as it is now, as the lubricant that would guarantee that the race of life was to run smoothly. Lester Frank Ward, a giant of 19th century sociology, wrote, Universal education is the power which is destined to overthrow every species of hierarchy. Of course, he didn't mean every species, because he went on to say, It is destined to remove all artificial inequality and to leave the natural inequalities to find their true level. The true value of a newborn infant lies in its naked capacity for acquiring the ability to do. This sentiment was echoed in 1969 by Professor Arthur Jensen, a psychologist at the University of California, who wrote about the inequality of intelligence of blacks and whites. He said, we have to face it. 
The assortment of persons into occupational roles simply is not fair in any absolute sense. The best we can hope for is that true merit, given a quality of opportunity, acts as a basis for the natural assorting process. This view of Jensen's has become the received wisdom among biologists up until the present time. Simply to assert that the race of life is fair and that different people have different intrinsic abilities to run it is not alone sufficient to explain the observations of inequality. After all, children seem by and large to acquire the social status of their parents. About 60% of the children of blue-collar workers remain blue-collar, while about 70% of white-collar workers' children are white-collar. But even these figures vastly overestimate the amount of social mobility. Most people who have passed from blue-collar to white-collar jobs have passed from factory production line jobs to office production line jobs, or become sales clerks, jobs that are less well-paid, less secure, and just as soul-destroying as the factory work done by their parents. The children of gas station attendants usually borrow money, and the children of oil magnets usually lend it. The chance that Nelson Rockefeller would have wound up pumping gas in a standard oil station was pretty close to zero. If we live in a meritocracy in which each person can rise to the status allowed by his or her innate capacities, how do we explain this passage of social power from parent to offspring? Are we really just back in the old aristocratic situation? The naturalistic explanation is to say that not only do we differ in our innate capacities, but those very innate capacities are transmitted from generation to generation biologically. That is to say, they're in our genes. The original social and economic notion of inheritance has been turned into biological inheritance. But even the claim that the intrinsic ability to win success is inherited in the genes is not sufficient to justify an unequal society. After all, I could claim that there ought not to be any particular relationship between what one can accomplish and what social and psychic rewards are given. We might give the same material and psychic rewards to house painters and picture painters to surgeons and to barbers, to professors who give lectures on the radio, and to the janitors who come in and clean up the studio afterwards. In the famous phrase, we might create a society on whose banners are inscribed, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. To meet this objection, there has been developed a biological theory of human nature, which says that while the differences between us are in our genes, there are certain inborn similarities among us all similarities of human nature that are also in our genes and that have been put into those genes by millions of years of evolution. These similarities guarantee that differences in ability will be converted into differences in status, that society is naturally hierarchical, and that a society of equal reward and equal status is biologically impossible. That is the message of such well-known books as On Human Nature by the eminent sociobiologist E.O. Wilson and of all the human sociobiology that has flowed from it in the last 20 years. We might pass laws requiring equality, but the moment the vigilance of the state is relaxed, we would return to doing what comes naturally. These three ideas, first, that we differ in fundamental abilities because of innate differences, second, that those innate differences are biologically inherited, and third, that human nature guarantees the formation of a hierarchical society when taken all together form what we can call the ideology of biological determinism. The idea that blood will tell was not invented by biologists. It's a dominant theme of 19th century literature, for example, and one can hardly appreciate the most praised and popular writers of the last century without seeing how a theory of innate difference informed their work. Think of Dickens' Oliver Twist, when Oliver first meets young Jack Dawkins, the artful dodger, on the road to London, a remarkable contrast in body and spirit is established. The dodger is described as a snub-nosed, flat-browed, common-faced boy with bow legs and little ugly eyes. And his English was not the best. But what can we expect from a ten-year-old street urchin with no family, no education, and only the lowest criminals of London for companions? Oliver's speech, however, is perfect and his manner is genteel. 
He is described as a pale, thin child, but with a good, sturdy spirit in his breast. His pronunciation is of the best. His grammar is perfect. He uses a subjunctive. Yet Oliver was raised from birth in the most degrading of 19th century British institutions, the parish workhouse, with no mother, no education, and little to eat. He is described as having spent the first nine years of his life rolling about on the floor all day without the inconvenience of too much food or too much clothing. Where, amid the oakum pickings, did Oliver garner that sensitivity of soul and perfection of English grammar? Oliver Twist is a mystery novel, and that's its mystery. The answer is that although his food was gruel, his blood was upper middle class. His mother was the daughter of a naval officer. His father's family was well off and socially ambitious. Nor is this only a madness of the Anglo-Saxons. The rougon macau novels of Émile Zola were deliberately written as a kind of experimental literature to illustrate the discoveries of 19th century anthropology. In the preface, Zola tells us that heredity has its laws just like gravitation. The rougon macau are a family descended from the two lovers of one woman, one of whom was a solid, industrious peasant while the other was a wastrel and degenerate. From the dependable peasant descend solid, honest stock, while from the degenerate ancestor descend a long line of social misfits and criminals, including the famous Nana, who was an infomaniac from early childhood, and whose mother, Gervaise, the laundress, despite beginning a solid entrepreneurial life, lapses back into her natural indolence. The public consciousness of the 19th century both in Europe and North America, was permeated with the notion that intrinsic differences in temperament and merit will finally dominate any mere effect of education and environment. The fictional rougon Macau are seen again in the equally fictional but supposedly real family of Calacax, who graced virtually every textbook of American psychology until the Second World War. The Calacax were supposed to be two halves of a family descended from two women of contrasting nature and a common father. This piece of academic fiction was meant to convince malleable young minds that criminality, laziness, alcoholism, and incest were really inborn and inherited. Nor were supposedly innate differences restricted to individual variation. Nations and races were said to be characterized by innate temperamental and intellectual differences. These claims were made not by racists, demagogues, and fascist know-nothings, but by the leaders of American academic, psychological, and sociological establishments. In 1923, Carl Brigham, who was later secretary of the College Entrance Examination Board, produced a study of intelligence under the direction of R. M. Yerkes, professor of psychology at Harvard and the president of the American Psychological Association, which asserted, among other things, that we must assume that we are measuring inborn intelligence. We must face the possibility of racial admixture here in America that is infinitely worse than that faced by any European country, for we are incorporating the Negro into our racial stock. The decline of the American intelligence will be more rapid owing to the presence here of the Negro. Yet another president of the American Psychological Association said, that whenever there has been mixed breeding with the Negro, there has been deterioration of civilizations. Louis Agassiz, one of the most famous zoologists of the 19th century, and I, by the way, am the Agassiz professor of zoology, asserted that the skull sutures of Negro babies closed earlier than the sutures of white babies, so that their brains were entrapped, and it would be dangerous to teach them too much. Perhaps the most extraordinary of claims was that of Henry Fairfield Osborne, who was president of the American Museum of Natural History and America's most eminent and prestigious paleontologist. He wrote, The northern races invaded the countries to the south, not only as conquerors, but as contributors of strong moral and intellectual elements to a more or less decadent civilization. Through the Nordic tide which flowed into Italy, came the ancestors of Raphael, Leonardo, Galileo, Tiziano, also, according to Gunther, of Giotto, Botticelli, Petrarca, and Tasso. Columbus, from his portraits and from busts, whether authentic or not, was clearly of Nordic ancestry. 
authentic or not indeed. Over and over again, leading intellectuals have assured their audiences that modern science shows that there are inborn racial and individual differences in ability. Nor have modern biologists taken a different view. Except for a brief interruption around the time of the Second World War, when the crimes of Nazism made claims of innate inferiority extremely unpopular, biological determinism has been the mainstream commitment of biologists till the present day. The post-war wave of biological determinism really began in 1969 with the publication of a famous article called How Much Can We Boost IQ and Scholastic Achievement in the Harvard Educational Review. This article was written by a professor of psychology from the University of California, Arthur Jensen. What soon became known all over as Jensenism argued that the inferior position of blacks in American society was a consequence of their genetic inferiority in intelligence. This was amplified four years later by Professor Richard Herrnstein, a Harvard psychologist, when he claimed that middle and lower classes were biologically different and that increasingly the lower classes were biologically doomed to their inferior position. When American cities erupted in urban riots and rebellion, respectable professors of anatomy and neurology argued that brain lesions were responsible for violent social action and that only surgery could prevent the burning down of American cities. Nor has the tide of determinism abated since. Every week sees another report of finding the genes for alcoholism, schizophrenia, drug taking, antisocial behavior, and violence. Or if the genes have not been found, they need to be sought. Just last month, in the pages of the New York Times, James Watson, the eminent Nobel Prize winner in biology, called for a support of a multi-billion dollar program to sequence the molecular structure of all human genes, in part because it would help us find the genes for depression and alcoholism. In the October 12th issue of Science Magazine, the leading scientific journal in North America, there's an extensive report on studies of twins claiming substantial influence of genes not only on intelligence, but also on occupational interest, traditionalism, and religiosity. These claims are made without a shred of evidence and in contradiction to every principle of biology and genetics. To realize the error of these claims, we need to understand what is really involved in the development of an organism. First, we are not determined by our genes, although surely we are influenced by them. Development depends on the materials that have been inherited from our parents, that is, the genes and other materials in the sperm and egg, but also on the particular temperature, humidity, nutrition, smell, sights, and sounds, including what we call education, that are impinging on a developing organism. Even if I knew the complete molecular specification of every gene in an organism, I could not tell what that organism will be. Of course, the difference between lions and lambs is almost certainly a consequence of the difference in genes between them. But variations among individuals within species are a unique consequence of both genes and the developmental environment in constant interaction. Even if I knew the genes of a developing organism, and if I knew the complete sequence of its environments, I could not specify the organism. There's yet another factor at work. For example, if we count the number of bristles underneath the wing of a fruit fly, something which zoologists are constantly doing, we will find that there are a different number on the left side than on the right side. There's no average difference between left and right among fruit flies. Some have more bristles on the left and some more on the right. So there's a kind of fluctuating asymmetry. An individual fruit fly, however, has the same genes on its left side as it has on its right side, just as we have the same genes on our left side and our right sides. Moreover, the tiny size of a developing fruit fly and the place in which it develops guarantee that both the left and right sides have had the same humidity, the same oxygen, the same temperature. So the differences between left and right sides are neither caused by genetic nor by environmental differences. These differences are caused by random variation in growth and division of cells during development. This is what we call developmental noise. This chance element in development turns out to cause a lot of variation. Indeed, in the case of the fruit fly bristles, 
there is as much variation consequent on developmental noise as there is from genetic and environmental variation. We do not know, in fact, in human beings, how much of the difference between us is a consequence of random differences in the growth of neurons during our embryonic life and early childhood. It's my own prejudice that even if I had practiced the violin from a very early age, I would not be able to play as well as Yehudi Menuhin. And I think of him as having very special neuronal connections. But that's not the same as saying that those neuronal connections were coded in his genes. There may be large random differences in the growth of our central nervous systems. It's a fundamental principle of developmental genetics that every organism is the outcome of a unique interaction between genes and environmental sequences modulated by the random chances of cell growth and division, and that all these together finally produce an organism. Moreover, an organism changes throughout its entire life. Human beings change their size, for instance, not only growing larger as they change from children to adults, but growing smaller again as they grow old and their joints and bones shrink a little. A more sophisticated version of genetic determinism, and one that permeates all the work on the heritability of intelligence, for example, agrees that organisms are a consequence of both environmental and genetic influences, but describes differences between individuals as differences in capacity. This is what I call the empty bucket metaphor. We begin life as empty buckets of different sizes. If we only provide a little bit of water, then all those buckets will have the same small amount in them. But if we provide a superabundance from the environment, then the little buckets will overflow and the larger ones will hold more. In this view, if every person were allowed to develop to his or her genetic capacity, then there would indeed be major differences in ability and performance, and these would be fair and natural. But there's no more biology in the metaphor of innate capacity than there is in the notion of fixed genetic effects. The unique interaction between organism and environment cannot be described by differences in capacity. So, it's true that if two genetically different organisms developed in exactly the same environment, they would be different. But that difference cannot be described as different capacities because the genetical type that was superior in one environment may be inferior in a second environment. For example, strains of rats can be selected for better or poorer ability to find their way through a maze. And those strains of rats pass on their differential ability to run the maze to their offspring. So there are certainly genetically different rats in this respect. But if exactly the same strains of rats were given a different task, or if the conditions of learning are changed, the bright rats turn out to be dull and the dull rats turn out to be bright. There is no general genetic superiority of one rat strain over another in finding its way through a problem. An even more subtle and more mystifying approach to biological determinism rejects both the genetic fixity of the first view and the capacity metaphor of the second, and is instead statistical. Essentially, it states that the problem is one of partitioning the effects of the environment and the genes so that we can say that perhaps 80% of the difference among individuals is due to their genes and 20% due to their environment. It is often said, for example, on the basis of twin studies, that 80% of the variation among individual children in their IQ performance is caused by variation in their genes, and only 20% is caused by variation in their environments. This is the view used, for example, by Professor Jensen in his article, How Much Can We Boost IQ and Scholastic Achievement? The implication is that if most of the variation among individuals in, say, intelligence is a consequence of variation among their genes, then manipulating the environment will not make much difference. This is a completely fallacious, although plausible sounding argument. There is, in fact, no connection whatsoever between the amount of variation that can be ascribed to genetic differences as opposed to environmental differences and whether or not a change in the environment will affect performance or by how much. We should remember that any very ordinary arithmetic student in primary school in Canada can correctly add a column of figures vastly more quickly than the most intelligent ancient Roman mathematician who had to struggle with a cumbersome set of X's, V's, and I's. That same ordinary student can multiply two five-digit numbers together 
with a $10 handheld calculator more quickly and accurately than any professor of mathematics could have done in the 19th century. A change in environment, in this case of cultural environment, can change abilities by many orders of magnitude. Moreover, the differences between individuals are abolished by cultural and mechanical inventions. Differences that are ascribable to genetic differences and that appear in one environment may disappear completely in another. For example, there may be biologically based differences in physique and strength between a random group of men and a random group of women, although these are less than usually supposed. But these differences rapidly become irrelevant and disappear from practical view in a world of electrically driven hoists, power steering, and electronic controls. So, the proportion of variation in a population that is a consequence of variation in genes is not a fixed property, but one that varies from environment to environment. Conversely, how much difference there is between us that is a consequence of environmental variation in our life histories depends on our genes. We know from experiments that organisms that have some sorts of genes are very sensitive to environmental variation, while other individuals with different genes are very insensitive to the same environmental variation. The point is that environmental variation and genetic variation are not independent causal pathways. Genes affect how sensitive one is to environment, and environment affects how relevant genetic differences may be. The interaction between them is inextricable, and we can only separate genetic and environmental effects statistically in a particular population of organisms at a particular moment in their history with a particular set of specified environments. When environment changes, all bets are off. The contrast between genetic and environmental, between nature and nurture, is not a contrast between fixed and changeable. It is a fallacy of biological determinism to say that if differences are in the genes, then no change can occur. We know this to be true from medical evidence alone. There are many so-called inborn errors of metabolism in which a defective gene results in normal circumstances in a defective physiology. One example is what's called Wilson's disease, a genetic defect that prevents its sufferers from detoxifying the copper that we all eat in small quantities in our ordinary food. The copper builds up in the body and eventually causes very severe nervous degeneration and finally death, sometime in adolescence or early adulthood. I have a friend, for example, three of whose children died before the age of 20 from this disease. Nothing could be more perfectly described as a genetic disorder. Yet people with this defective gene can now lead a perfectly normal life and have a normal development simply by taking a recently developed pill that helps them get rid of the copper. And they are then indistinguishable from anyone else. Aside from the conceptual difficulties of trying to ascribe separate effects to genes and environment, there are very severe experimental difficulties in detecting the influence of genes, especially when we deal with human beings. How do we in fact decide whether genes influence differences in some trait? In all organisms, the process is the same. We compare individuals who are differently related to one another, and if more closely related individuals are more similar than more distantly related ones, we ascribe some power to the genes. That's why we're interested in studying twins, for example. But herein lies the deep difficulty of human genetics. Unlike experimental animals, people who are more closely related to each other not only share more genes in common, but they also share environment in common because of the family and class structure of human society. The observation that children resemble their parents in some trait does not distinguish between similarity that comes from genetic similarity and similarity that arises from environmental similarity. The resemblance of parents and children is the observation, which is to be explained. It's not evidence for genes. For example, two social traits that have the highest resemblance between parents and children in North America are religious sect and political party. Yet even the most ardent biological determinist, at least the most ardent one that I've ever met, would not seriously argue that there is a gene for Episcopalianism or for voting social credit. The problem is to distinguish genetic similarity from environmental similarity. It's for this reason that so much emphasis has been put in human genetics on twin studies. 
The idea is that if twins are more similar than ordinary sibs, who are after all raised together in the family, or if twins raised in completely isolated families are still similar, then this surely must be evidence for genes. In particular, there's been a fascination with a study of identical twins raised apart. If identical twins, that is, twins sharing all the same genes, are similar even though they're raised apart, then their traits must be strongly influenced genetically. Much of the claim for high heritability of IQ, for example, comes from the studies of identical twins raised apart. There have really only been three major studies published. The first and largest set of studies was reported by Sir Cyril Burt back in the 1950s. This is the only set of studies that claimed no similarity of family circumstances between the families that raised the separated twins. Obviously, the similarity of family circumstances is important because we're trying to distinguish between similarity of twins that arises from their genes and similarity that arises from similar family environments. These studies also claimed a heritability of 80% for IQ. However, careful investigation by Oliver Gilly of the Times of London and Professor Leon Kamen at Princeton revealed that Bert had simply made it all up. He'd made up the numbers, he'd made up the twins. He even made up the collaborators whose names appeared with his in the publications. We really need consider these claims no further. They represent one of the great scandals of modern psychology and biology. When we look at the other studies, which actually give details about the families that raise the separated twins, we realize that we don't, in fact, live in a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. We live in a real world. The reason that twins are separated at birth may be that their mother has died in childbirth, so that one twin is raised by an aunt and another by a best friend or a grandmother. Sometimes the parents cannot afford to keep both children, so they give one to a sister or another relative. In fact, most children raised apart are not raised apart at all. They are raised by members of the same extended family in the same small village. They went to school together. They played together. Other IQ studies on adopted children that are said to demonstrate the effect of genes have other experimental difficulties, including the failure to match children by age, or that they are extremely small samples, or that they are biased by selection of cases for study. As a consequence of such biases, there is at present simply no convincing evidence of the role of genes in influencing human behavioral variation. Even if we could determine for certain what traits were inherited. There is a constant confusion between what is inherited and what is unchangeable. When one looks at all the studies of adoption, in order to study the genetic influence on intelligence, there are two constant results. First, children do resemble their biological parents from whom they are separated in the sense that the higher the IQ score of the biological parent, the higher the IQ score of the child who is adopted. So biological parents are having some influence on the IQ of their children, even though those children were adopted early. And putting aside the possibility of prenatal nutritional differences or extremely early stimulation, it would be reasonable to say that genes have some influence on IQ scores. But the second constant feature of such adoption studies is that the IQ test scores of those children who were adopted are about 20 points higher than those of their biological parents. It's still the case that the biological parents with the higher IQ scores had children with higher IQ scores, but the children as a group have moved well ahead of their biological parents. In fact, the average IQ scores of those children who were adopted are about equal to the average IQ scores of the adopting parents. And those adopting parents always do much better on IQ tests than the biological parents. What's all this about? It's a revelation of the actual meaning of IQ tests and of the social reality of adoption. First, what do IQ tests actually measure? They are a combination of numerical, vocabulary, educational, and attitudinal questions. They ask such things as, who was Wilkins Micawber? Or, what is the meaning of sudiferous? Or, what should a girl do if a boy hits her? Uh, hitting him back is not the right answer. 
And how do we know that someone who does well on such a test is intelligent? In fact, the tests were originally standardized to pick out precisely those children in a class whom the teacher had already labeled as intelligent. That is, IQ tests are instruments for giving an apparently objective and scientific basis to the social prejudices of educational institutions. After all, IQ tests are published, they are sold at very high prices. What school would buy an intelligence test that picked out the children in the class whom the teachers knew in advance were dumb? Second, people who decide on an early adoption for their children are usually working class or unemployed people who do not share in the education and culture of the middle class. People who adopt children, on the other hand, are usually middle class and have an appropriate education and cultural experience for the content and intent of IQ tests. So adopting parents as a group have a much higher IQ performance than the parents who have chosen adoption for their children. The educational and family environment in which these children are now raised has the expected result of raising all their IQs, even though there is evidence for some genetic influence of unknown origin from their biological parents. These results of adoption studies illustrate perfectly why you cannot answer a question about how much something can be changed by answering a different question, namely, are there genes influencing the trait? If we wanted seriously to ask the question posed by Arthur Jensen in his famous article, How Much Can We Boost IQ and Scholastic Achievement? The only way we could know how to answer that question would be to try to boost IQ and scholastic achievement. We do not answer it by asking, as he did, is there a genetic influence on IQ? Because to be genetic is not to be unchangeable. In a long-established set of orphanages in Britain, Dr. Bernardo's homes, where children are brought as orphans soon after birth, a study was done testing the intelligence of children of black and white ancestry. Several different tests were given at various ages. If I said nothing more about that, my guess is that most of you would assume that there were small differences with whites being better than blacks. But in fact, the reverse was true. The differences were not significant, and where there were any differences, they were in favor of blacks. There is not an iota of evidence of any kind that the differences in status, wealth, and power between races in North America have anything to do with genes, except, of course, for the genes of skin color. Indeed, there's a great deal less difference genetically in general between races than one might suppose from the superficial cues we all use in distinguishing races. Skin color, hair form, nose shape are certainly influenced by genes. But we do not know how many such genes there are or how they work. On the other hand, when we look at genes we do know something about, genes that influence our blood type, for example, or genes for the various enzyme molecules essential to our physiology, what we find is that although there's a tremendous amount of variation from individual to individual, there's remarkably little variation on the average between major human groups. In fact, about 85% of all identified known human genetic variation is between any two individuals from the same ethnic group. There's another 8% of all the variation between ethnic groups within a race, say between Spaniards, Irish, Italians, Britons, and so on. And only 7% of all human genetic variation lies on the average between major human races, like the races of Africa, or Asia, or Europe, or Oceania. So, we have no reason a priori to think that there would be any genetic differentiation between racial groups with respect to characteristics like behavior, or temperament, or intelligence. Nor is there an iota of evidence that social classes, working class, middle class, owners, unemployed, differ in any way in their genes except insofar as ethnic origin or race may be used as a form of economic discrimination. The nonsense propagated by ideologues of biological determinism that the lower classes are biologically inferior to the upper classes that all the good things in European culture come from Nordic groups is precisely nonsense. It is meant to legitimate the structures of inequality in our society by putting on them a biological gloss and by propagating the continual confusion between what may be influenced by genes and what may be changed by social and environmental alterations. The vulgar error that confuses heritability and fixity has been, over the years,
the most powerful single weapon that biological ideologues have had in legitimating a society of inequality. Since, as biologists, they must know better, one is entitled to at least a suspicion that the beneficiaries of a system of inequality are not to be regarded as objective experts. The 1990 Massey Lectures, presented by Richard C. Lewinton, continue tomorrow night on Ideas.